Meet Antonio Lascano. He's a biologist and historian of biology and historian of the idea of the origin of life. He's at the National Autonomous University of Mexico. Now, he's written many papers about the history of science and the history of the origin of life studies, and also two books. One about Alexander Oparin and La Chispa de la Vida, means the spark of life, and also on the origin of life. It was 2008 and 2012. And I sat down with him at, uh, in Paris, and we asked, and we talked about, are we alone? Um, my name is Antonio Lascano. I'm a Mexican professor of uh, Origins of Life uh, at the National University of Mexico and a member of the Colegio Nacional. And what do you do? Well, um, I'm very much involved in trying to understand how life appeared on Earth and its early evolution. So I have been engaged in experiments trying to simulate the primitive environment and analysis of meteorites. And uh, mostly nowadays what I do is um, analysis of sequences of full genomes that are available in the web. So I can try to have a good understanding as far as possible of the early evolution of metabolic pathways, of the early evolution of the biological traits by making comparisons. And uh, I'm also very keen on the history of the ideas of the origins of life because I think they are, it's a fascinating subject. Okay, and are we alone? I think so. I'm, I'm sure that we are uh, in the solar system. I think we have always been alone. I don't think that life appears in other parts of the, of the solar system, regardless of what many of my colleagues say. And I think that uh, although life may, not, life may not be so rare in the universe, I don't think that uh, life uh, with animals and primates and thinking and uh, societies like us are very common. I think there are probably many other ways in which life can appear and evolve in the universe, but like us, I think we are basically alone. So the many other ways, do you mean mostly microbial? I, if you ask me, let me answer the way that Ernest Haeckel said in the 19th century when he was making comments on, on Camille Flammarion book on the plurality de mon habité. Uh, I think that yeah, microbial life may exist in other parts of the galaxy, in other parts of the universe, but things like us, I think, are quite rare. And why do you think that? Well, uh, if you look at the evolution of life on Earth, uh, clearly the animals represent a truly minor component of the huge diversity of life that existed, or, even if we are very obvious because of our size and so on. But, um, but the history of animals and the history of uh, primates is the outcome of so many incidents, geological incidents and mutations and chance events that I think that it's very rare that history will repeat in the same way in other parts of the universe. That doesn't mean that uh, there are not different ways in which uh, matter could organize itself, but I don't think that uh, animals like us are very frequent. I think that there is a tremendous amount of hype about Mars. I think that the people think uh, that, I, I believe that the people think that Mars uh, was very much like the Earth, uh, the earliest stages of the history of the solar system. That is not proven. That's a hypothesis that not, not all planetologists share. And uh, even so, uh, remember that we really do not know how life appeared on Earth, and we will never know how life appeared on Earth. The records are bygone, so we really have no idea. But I think that even if we assume that, uh, uh, that life, uh, which I think is a very good assumption, that life is the natural outcome of uh, a process of evolution, we really do not know what role was played by chance, by the chance impact of a comet, by the presence of the moon, by the presence of uh, tides, and so on. So who knows if those things also happen on Mars? I think they make up for a very nice storyline, but I don't think that's very scientific to say that life did appear on Mars and that it very likely is still there. Carl Sagan uh, must have views that are different from yours. For example, he said that uh, the humans are the way the universe has to becoming self-aware. That, we... that actually comes from Hegel. Hegel. Hegel said it first, yeah. Okay, so Carl Sagan borrowed it from Hegel. Well, perhaps unknowingly, no. but uh, Hegel said it and then 
Engels said it in a very dogmatic way, but. Uh, now, no. given the idea that you don't think human-like intelligence evolves elsewhere, you must think that that's crazy, or what do you think of that idea? No, think, let, me, let me use a very parochial example, which is the case of human, the human brain, the flexibility of the human brain in, on Earth. If you look at the way we use the silver when dining, you have the fork and you have the knife. If you go to Japan or to China, the people will eat with chopsticks. That in itself is an extraordinary example of the flexibility of the human mind. The plasticity that we have that allows us just in this planet to uh, use the brain and the intelligence to come out with completely different solutions to the same problem. Think of the spoon. If you look at a spoon from uh, a Chinese spoon or a spoon in the West, they are basically the same because there's only one way in which you can make a spoon that works. So I think that is telling you a lot about the restrictions and the flexibility, the plasticity of uh, human creativity. If that's true for the Earth, why should we, uh, shouldn't we assume that it's true if there is intelligent life elsewhere? I thought you said you don't think that there's intelligent life. I don't think that the way we define intelligence, I, the, the, the way we define prime as a way we define our history, I don't think there is. But, uh, but I mean, that's just an example of how uh, plastic the human mind is. Well, some people would take that exact argument and say, it's, sm it's better to be smart than it is to be stupid. It's better to have a big brain and flexibility and it's more adaptive than the contrary. Well, and that's the basis they use for believing that there is human-like intelligence elsewhere. Yeah, but, uh, but it's also true that you have examples of very stupid animals on Earth. They are survivors of, uh, after many million years of the uh, history of the biosphere. Think of the koala, if you want to think of a mammal, well, of an animal that's closer to us, or think of the, of the slugs, the marine slugs, that do not appear to be very intelligent by any account. I mean, and they are still there. So, get being smart, there's no such, you don't believe in an intelligence niche then? Oh, I, I think that intelligence is a wonderful trait to survive in a given uh, lifestyle, in a given niche, but I don't think it's the only one. Or you don't think there's a generic intelligence niche? Uh, it depends how you define what kinds of intelligence. Again, I need to see a good definition of intelligence that acknowledges the diversity. 